welcome everybody to a Masterminds Roundtable, very special edition with uh, the Dungeon Masters of Eagle's Claw American School of Magic. I'm Kristen Kalina, the founder of Mastermind Adventures, and I'm super excited uh, to introduce our Dungeon Masters for this year's event. And um, I don't really have a ton to say, except for that you guys are going to love them. And uh, I can't wait to hear about all of their plans for this year's show. Here they are. Yay! <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning, guys. I'm so excited to have this conversation with you guys. Um, I'm really excited for Eagles Claw this year. I know that we have a really, really fun um, uh, event coming up with this. This is our first time doing Eagles Claw virtually. We've done now two different live streams with um, one with the kids who grew up coming to Eagles Claw. And then we did one last week with uh, the professors who are going to be doing classes at Eagles Claw. Um, but you guys are um, a really important part of this, uh, this online adventure that we're doing. And of course, you're near and dear to my heart as uh, the folks who work with us at Mastermind. Um, so let's just take a minute and just have you guys go around and just introduce yourself and talk about what house that you're sorted into. So let's see. Uh, first to go, John. Hi, I'm John Pro GM here at Mastermind Adventures. I run a lot of D&D 5e games. Um, happy to be here and excited to run Eagle's Claw content. Awesome. Arthur, you are next. Hi, I'm Arthur. I am a proud uh, Grizzle Heart, um, and I run games in a bunch of tabletop role-playing games, but I'm excited to run a 5th edition adventure uh, of Dungeons & Dragons for y'all for Eagle's Claw. All right, Mariah. Oh, hey, it's me. You are. Uh, hi. <laughs> I am Mariah. I am also a Grizzleheart. And wait, Grizzleheart. There we go. And I am going to be running a fifth edition adventure. I mostly run in fifth edition D&D. &D, uh, and I'm very excited for the uh, adventure I have planned for Eagles Claw. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Allie. Hi, everyone. I'm uh, Ali Salentic. I am the Master of Lore from Mastermind Adventures. Um, I am not running one of these, uh, the games that these lovely jams are running, but I did write the uh, overall adventure. So I'm really excited to introduce people to Eagle's Claw or to welcome them back. Uh, it's been too long since we did Eagle's Claw. I agree. All right, Greg, you're next. Uh, good morning. My name is, wait, let me make sure I'm on. Yep, good. Good morning. My name is Greg, and uh, I'm representing the West Coast here for Mastermind Adventures based in Los Angeles. I am a uh, pro professional uh, dungeon master here for Mastermind, and uh, my normal campaign is Secrets of the Barrow Maze. You can check it out at secretsofthebarrowmaze.com, but I am super excited to be running a very special spring break adventure for the students at Eagle's Claw, and I'm also a very, very proud Grizzleheart. Gotta rep the green and silver, baby. Let's go. <laughs> Awesome. All right, Sarah, last but not least. Hello, I'm Sarah, and I'm here representing the Murdoch house, best house of all. And uh, I'm, <laughs> um, I run a lot of games for kids and teens, and I'm really excited to start exploring this new world together as we explore this new magical school that um, will bring a lot of joy to everybody, I think. Awesome. All right. So um, there they all are. Thanks so much, guys, for joining us. And um, all right, so um, so we've talked a lot about in, in past streams, we kind of talked a lot about what Eagle's Claw is um, and sort of what it's about. I'm going to just do a quick just snippet. So Eagle's Claw American School of Magic started in 2015 as a sort of a live action role play version of, of, uh, of a magic school. And um, it's gone through many different phases over the years. And when the pandemic came, uh, we could not run an in-person event. So for the past two years, we really haven't been able to kind of get back to um, our stories and things like that. So last year, we'd actually envisioned an Eagle's Claw that could be virtual, but we just didn't have the bandwidth to do it. And so we are bringing it to you um, this year virtually. Um, the kids will be able to get sorted into houses like our awesome dungeon masters have. Um, and they will go, uh, they, they will have both a sort of an over long arcing adventure um, that they'll work together to solve. They're going to have an opportunity to take classes um, and then also do a Dungeons and Dragons exploration kind of um, adventure um, that kind of gets them to explore different parts of the castle. 
um, or uh, or even outside of the castle grounds, there might be some things for them to find and learn. Um, and then we're also doing a week long spring break adventure, as Greg mentioned. That'll be half day D and D uh, sessions Monday through Friday, the week of spring break for the East Coast. Um, and we're also starting some just Dungeons and Dragons weekly meetup tables in this universe. So if your kid can't make the event on the 16th or doesn't have spring break at the same time, they can certainly join us at any time um, just starting a new adventure with their character. Um, so uh, let's see, I have some questions to kind of get our conversation started. You've all had years of experience facilitating games, both for adults and for kids. So how do you think that designing games uh, for kids and teens is a little bit different than when you're thinking about doing it for adults? Ooh. Well, um... In my experience, younger people have an appreciation for like the little things in the world, like the little details that make the world seem alive. Uh, when they see one of these things, they want to they want to check it out. They want to touch it and be a part of it. They're not afraid of getting into the weeds in any setting. Like um, <clears throat> with adults, they tend to get stuck into the rules of the uh, of the the game instead of like the details of the world that are that really make things seem more real in a fantastic way. I totally agree. I think, uh, I, I say this a lot, but I think the great thing about running games for kids is they don't know what the wrong thing to do is. I think a lot of times when we play games enough, we kind of get into the rote idea of like what an adventure is supposed to look like or what uh, as a player I am supposed to do, but kids, do not have any of that background or baggage coming into a game and they're just going to follow what they're excited about which as a dungeon master is my favorite thing because if i if you are very clear about what you're excited about i can put that more in my game and i can focus on that to give you the experience you want to have one of the things i love about running games with kids is that because they're kids they're still using their imaginations as sort of like a learning muscle like when we're kids we we play so naturally anything can be a toy anything can be a game um you, you see so many kids just running around with sticks and that's their adventure and so i feel like you get to really tap into that imaginative potential when when they're playing together and i love um giving them a little bit more framework so that we can tell a story that's not just and then i do this no you don't i do that you know it's like it's like there's enough rules to sort of allow them to come up with their own stories that that make sense and that have a little bit more structure so that we can really collaboratively tell a really fun story together. I love that. You know, I really appreciate how kids um, problem solve in a D&D &D game. Oftentimes, especially when I'm playing running games for adults, they already know a lot of the rules. They already know a lot of the monsters. And what's nice is that uh, kids will do something completely different. Instead of attacking the goblins, they'll say, I'm going to try to talk them into sharing their lunch. And I'm like, okay, go for it. I like how they, uh, they do something completely different. And it makes me have to really keep on my toes a little bit more than what I have to, when I am playing with adults, which is nice. Mm. Oh, I, I 100% agree with that. I 100% agree with that because, um, I mean, normally when I'm running Barrow Maze sessions or uh, e even any of my other game sessions, I deal with uh, tables of adults who uh, are like, all right, let's just roll for initiative. Let's go. Let's go. And they just want to they just want to explode dice everywhere and, uh, you know, be dropping fireballs and stuff. And uh, Mariah, I covered one of your your tables recently. Uh, mm -hmm. earlier this week and I had a group full of kids and I, 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 they, they, first off, they problem solved and burned through, uh, an adventure that I, a, a stock adventure that I had that takes most adults two to two and a half hours to yep. get through it. They did it in 45 minutes and I had to spend, <laughs> the like next, I had to spend the, the next two hours of the session improvising to come up with stuff just to keep up and keep, keep, keep everybody engaged. And one of the things that I did was like, okay, I'm just going to throw an ogre at him. So I was like, okay, fee, fi, fo, fum. An ogre comes out and, and he's like, I'm going to turn your bones into flour for my bread. And they're like, and, and I was like, all right, guys, roll for initiative. And they're like, and, and they won the initiative. And they, and I was like, all right, what are you going to, what are you going to cast? What are you going to do? And they're like, we're going to talk to him. I'm like, I'm, you're going to what? 
<laughs> and then they start rolling persuasion and then they start rolling deception and then they start rolling and and i was like he's gonna go home and rethink his life choices now okay yeah that was <laughs> and i was like wow you overcame this 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 uh this encounter in in 30 seconds um now I have to think of something else we could do. <laughs> yep. they, but they were, they were, they were genius though. Like I was like, I can't be mad at this. They're, they're excellent. So I, I really, I, I, and I've, I've had this experience with other kids tables too. They, they still have that sense of wonder and they love to think outside of the box. Uh, yeah. I, I have another little litmus test story of kids versus adults, but I don't want to hog the mic right now. So I'll save it maybe for <laughs> a more, another appropriate time as we keep going. Yeah, well, I mean that we've got lots of time to to talk and kind of explore, um, you know, stories and things like that. Do you guys have like a secret weapon when it comes to keeping kids engaged um, at the table? As Greg says, like sometimes they can burn through the content a little bit quickly, or or do something just completely to throw things off the rails. So how do you how do you manage that as a dungeon master? Um, I say okay. <laughs> uh, good a example. A lot of yes ands. A lot of yes ands. I had I was running an adventure for that same group of kids. I'm like, all right, they have to go into this into the sewer, and there's going to be like an incubus and a succubus, and they're summoning a horrible demon and stuff like that. And these kids just dragged over a a a, a, a picture of like a giant who was going to be helping them and stuff. And they're like, we're going to be looking for cows. And I went, okay. And I put a whole bunch of cows on there. Like, I'm going to name my cow this. I'm going to name my cow that. And then I just started typing in the names just slightly wrong. And they were like, wait, no, it's like this. Oh, oh, sorry. And I kept just doing it over and over again. And it was hilarious because they were like, wait, no, I want my cow to be named Batman. I'm like, okay, well, your cow is named the hero that Gotham deserves. <laughs> <laughs> Stuff like that. They're like, okay. And it's just saying okay and rolling with it because honestly, you're going to get a bigger, better reaction and more engagement that way. Yeah, I mean, if you want to see, if you want an actual like secret thing to do, give them all horses and say, "What does your horse look like?" And then you've got the next half hour just planned out. They're going to tell you what their horse looks like, or anything. Just give them like, "Oh, you all have a thing. What does it look like?" And they will tell you, and it's going to be great. And you can also learn a lot about them as people that way. Um, but also, like a more overarching thing that I learned from my time working at summer camps is uh, a, a phrase I learned is uh, be the most interesting thing in the room. Um, if like I have, I have taught uh, like workshops in a park where there is like uh, an officer walking a horse, like on a horse by like on a road quick by and there's an eagle going past and I'm like, man, I have to be more interesting than a horse and an eagle just coming by and you've just got to be like engaging and uh like keep them in in the game and ask them questions kids love to like, ask questions mm -hmm. that's for sure i think everybody likes to be asked questions any other secret kristen do you feel that's true i do i do oh. think that's true <laughs> it's, it's not necessarily a secret weapon it's just it's time to pay attention when when a kid's attention starts flagging something about the adventure isn't connecting with them and it's time to either throw something weird at them or shift the spotlight in such a way that it that it casts the right shadow you know like you've you've got to take your adventure that maybe isn't working as well as you'd like and then throw something strange at it and and wait and see how they react to these things do they react well to unpredictability or do are they looking for a place to jump in or do they just want to observe if they just want to observe get something interesting for them to to interact with just by observing you know it's mm -hmm it's really about reading the room. It's tough online. It's tougher online, but it, it works. Like as long as you're being attentive and you, you keep it, you, you keep your eye on them. It, you can make almost anything work with kids. I think using humor as a tool as well, you know, I think sometimes kids like they like to laugh and they like to have fun. They're playing a game to have fun. And so if they're bored, like if you can tell that they're getting bored fighting this monster, it's like, oh, the monster's dead and it explodes. And now you're covered in slime and the slime smells like lime jello. Do you eat it? <laughs> and then like they have to be like, no, I never eat it. And then it's like there's always one who's like, I eat it. And it's like all of a sudden you start to feel your body turning into jello. Like you're, you start to notice that your bones are disappearing. It looks like you've now got 
to jello sickness. It's like, you know, just like nonsense that doesn't, it's not in the rule book, like changing it up so that it's funny and that it doesn't, it's like absurdist, like Monty Python type. I feel like Monty Python's Holy Grail is my like fantasy framework when I'm running a game with kids. <laughs> like it's got some rules. It makes, there's, there's a structure to it, but also anything can happen. And, um, it's, uh, and and I think you know sometimes you got and then you get to like lean into like the nonsense like oh no you've got the terrible jello sickness everybody we have to find a cure to the jello sickness maybe there's something in the corpse maybe we can loot the corpse and like they're they're trying and they come up with solutions that would be like I could never come up with and I I love I, I that's what I love about playing with kids is that it's a fun game it's all there's never like there's almost never somebody who's who's out there to just win they're there to have fun. Wait, right. did we find the cure? What happened next? I know, Greg. <laughs> Arthur's like into this story now. You've got him picked. I gotta know, Sarah. That's because you're the one with the jello sickness, Arthur. And out of all of this group, it would be a hundred percent Arthur who would eat the lime flavored slime jello. Like lime flavored is my favorite yeah. jello. I don't care if it came from an exploding ogre. Like, that, my best that, friends. that checks out for sure. Um, so uh, let's talk a little bit about this this Strixhaven, the D&D, the Dungeons and Dragons Strixhaven uh, universe. There are a few things that are a little bit different. You know, every time a new source book comes out, they always add some some kind of new special uh, things. Um, and uh, so, you know, tell, talk a little bit about what is this setting um, like? How is it different? Um, you know, what can they look forward to that's different about the setting? Well, um, as opposed to Strixhaven, like uh, Eagle's Claw is a lot more intimate than like the regular Strixhaven setting. Strixhaven has like a more collegiate feel to it. It's a huge campus where you can, everybody can just fade into obscurity. Eagle's Claw isn't like that. It's a school like run out of a, uh, like a New England uh, manor turned turned big magic school, and everyone lives with each other, and it's got uh, everyone is able to interact with each other in meaningful ways. You're not just going to go back to your dorm and just sit there, you know, uh, studying your your material. Everyone's right there, and there's always a chance for interpersonal interaction and and drama and uh, events to happen where everybody gets to see. Right. But uh, but mechanically, there are some new things, right, about the strict statement. I'm, I'm correct about that, right? There's a little few new things about the way that this is that this is kind of formatted. Um, there's some new things from Dungeons and Dragons um, to sort of like kind of how it, how they've organized things. There's new. I know there's new um, races that you can play, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And... So there's like the Owlin race, which is like a uh, type of owl uh, based era coke or like a bird type people. Um, but there's also one thing I really thought was interesting about the Strixhaven setting is that fact that it takes place over the course of years, which is neat. So, um, like when you're a first year, like you're not sorted into like a house or anything, uh, quite yet, but there are also, there are also all types of interesting things you could do. You could work on campus. There's a coffee shop adventure in Strixhaven, which is great. It's hilarious. I've played through it before. And, um, I know it's specifically something that is supposed to fit into like the Magic the Gathering type uh, situation with Strixhaven specifically, but um, I re really appreciate some of the stuff that they do in regards to, like there's an orientation day, there's um, there's a coffee shop adventure, there's a masquerade ball, there's all types of things where, you know, when you think about like, oh, a magical school, like whether you've been to a LARP or otherwise, um, all of those things are a part of that whole experience. And I really appreciate that they include those experiences within the book and we can incorporate them into these adventures that we're going to be running. Right. Yeah. One thing I really One of the things about... I love about Strixhaven is the um, the different colleges. So like we, we've been doing something different with Eagle's Claw and that we've got our different houses, but I really love specifically like the necromancy in the story where it's a, uh, a college uh, wither bloom in, in Strixhaven, but um, where you're learning about death, but you're also learning about growth, like plant growth and life and um, bringing things back and, and, but, but in a way that, that makes it beautiful. I don't know. I, I always just really like that side of it. I just love necromancy. <laughs> I think um, it's yeah. Uh, 
one thing I really like is there are like relationship options and that you can play that as romance, but you can also play that as friendship. But um, in in D and D, like I think a lot of us are moving towards more role play focused games, and like Fifth Edition has been more role play uh, focused and more like streamlined than previous systems. But there's not really a system for building a relationship over time like your dm can decide that but there's not any benefit to that there's not anything different but the the relationship options uh like reward you with spending time with specific npcs that you like which i think is a thing we already do and creates both mechanics and like deeper role play through that and i think it's really cool that we're like th there aren't a lot of systems out there that have that type that focus that much on role play in the sense that like besides just like oh i roll a die plus my charisma cool they like me now um and i you can kind of build it over time and like if someone really doesn't like you just because you roll really well it doesn't mean they necessarily do what you want but also if someone really likes you even if you like say the wrong thing they'll still like you and understand and maybe do what you want and it can fluctuate and change over time which i think is really cool mm. yeah also there's LARPing as an extracurricular activity. I saw um, that. <laughs> and wizard LARPing is something that, like, this actually frustrates me a little bit because in the in the book, it's not very spelled out what that looks like. But, like, what do wizards LARP like is a question that is on my mind every day I wake up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, they take dice and they sit around a table. <laughs> right? Yeah. One of the things actually that I love about Strixhaven is that um, it's uh, it's not only inclusive to like all um, like species and cultures, but it's also inclusive to all classes. So you can be like a fighter attending the school, even if you don't take like the Eldritch Knight path and go that you can still attend Strixhaven and get something out of it. And And that's something that I know I've struggled with my own magical school setting of trying to figure out how you can give that choice to the players without having to limit what they can do in the school. And I just, I think they did it in a really brilliant way to kind of just have each class have a place in the school within any of the five uh, school, like colleges that they have. Um, I think it's, it's really, it's good because it means that the uh, players don't have to limit what they're doing. You don't have to say, well, you can't really play a, you know, an artificer that, that, you know, that does this thing, you can't really play a ranger, you can do all of those things. And it really helps to make the school feel well rounded. Yep. I agree. Sorry, I was adding, I was adding Sarah back to the screen, <laughs> the stream that she dropped for a minute. Um, Sorry was, about that. That's okay. Yeah, no big deal. Um, so, um, so yeah, yeah, I, I, I noticed that I think, um, I, I liked the, the the mechanic about like having friendships and even rivals. I think you can have um, like factions or, or something like that, which I thought was um, was really interesting and and sort of different. Um, and then, yeah, John, as it, as it applies to Eagle's Claw, um, what are some of the things um, specifically about this story um, that we're taking in? Or actually, I think maybe have Ali. You can because you're you know you're the one who's who's kind of laid Strixhaven rules on top of our existing lore for Eagles class. So maybe talk a little bit about um, about how you've done that and uh, and how we've adapted it for uh, for this type of play. Sure. Um, so one of the things when I was uh, going through the Strixhaven book and pulling mechanics out to kind of make more custom things was I wanted to make sure that any of the changes that we made were very easy for uh, the kids to learn. Um, D and D uh, fifth edition is probably the most accessible version of D and D, but it's still a little bit of a, a, a learning curve when you get into it. And um, I, my kind of principles to that were to say that, you know, a lot of these mechanics that we're adding in have to be easy to understand. Um, and Strixhaven itself does a great job with kind of demystifying the school setting. Um, they have rules for uh, pretty much everything, um, classes, uh, extracurriculars, um, you know, big, those big kind of flagship events that every magical school has. Um, so uh, the stuff that we had to add in as, as things were basically just reskins of a lot of the existing Strixhaven rules. 
Um, we have a couple of new backgrounds that focus on students from a particular house. So the four houses of uh, Eagle's Claw are uh, Grizzleheart, Lamassador, Murdoch, and Snowbeak. And each one of those has a specific background that you can take that will give you specialized equipment and also uh, a special ability that ties to the kind of um, overarching idea of each of these houses. Um, the other thing we did is that we have um, some special, we have a specialized feat um, that is based on the, the, the house that you're a part of. And it gives you access to new uh, spells and things like that. Even if you're, again, a class that doesn't necessarily have uh, a lot of spells to work with. So, you know, a fighter could still cast some of these spells a couple times a day. It kind of keeps everything um, a very magic school based, but also, again, very customizable for each individual student. Um, so those were kind of the, the, the big changes that we made. Um, everything else is kind of uh, par parts of the story. Um, the, the, the overarching like arc of the story of this event focuses a lot on the school and learning about at least one of the founders. Um, and, uh, everything else is, is kind of just your standard D and D. So. Awesome. So, um, so yeah, so as, uh, as we're talking more specifically about, um, Eagle's Claw, um, what's something as dungeon masters that kind of intrigues you or inspires you about this storyline and this kind of new school of magic that we've uh, that we've created? I I really like how inclusive uh, Eagle's Claw is. Um, I think it's really cool that like this is something I always had a problem with like other magical schools is like the fact that like like centaurs or like like goblins like other different like D, D is full of a lot of interesting and varied races but like in most magical schools it's like yeah you got you got humans maybe elves or dwarves or gnomes like maybe but in like eagle's claw you can come in and be whatever you want like you we you come as you are and we will accept you so like you're going to walk down the hall and you're going to see like mermaids and tritons in the pool and you're gonna see uh, like Aarakroka and Owl Folk just like flying in, and they're just gonna be a wide diverse of people and classes, as uh, Ali pointed out. I think that's really fun, and makes the uh, makes the school my more dynamic and fun. Yeah, in this uh, in this world, like magic isn't exactly commonplace, but more people have it than you uh, than people realize, and. Having people live um, right next to each other, you know, like fantasy uh, fantasy races, like you know, mermaids are next to minotaurs, or are next to fairies, and having the school have special things to accommodate all these folks and have them live together is a really interesting thing that it's fun to think about, and it's even more fun to just live for a while. And also, I'm looking forward to how how the kids deal with their special. Uh, house feats and spells even when they're a combat class it's good we're going to see things we're going to see them create characters that you know weren't possible before or at least were very unusual and we're going to have them solving problems with a lot of the mechanics they've they've got in eagle's claw where they they don't have it in other versions of D. &D. it's gonna be pretty cool Oh yeah, thinking about the accessibility of how like a centaur and a fairy can go about taking the same classes and moving down the same hallway is like very interesting to me. Uh, so like that is a conversation that I could have any day of the week, and I love like creating magical ways that like these very different folks can inhabit the same space. I kind of love the fact that this school is based in uh, is based in New England. Uh, I mean, especially with uh, New England's history and, and uh, uh, rich, deep American history in particular and the ties to uh, things like the witch trials and the uh, uh, the revolution and all these other things. I mean, I have a lot of personal family history based in uh, New England, so I might wind up having like some of my uh, my own family history thrown into the uh, the spring break storyline that I've got planned uh as well as you know a lot of my other standard influences uh i think i threw around the phrase kobayashi maru at one point uh but that's uh you know uh that's just my cruel sense of humor <laughs> for what i like to do <laughs> players so is 
So I, I like the yeah. idea of exploring like a New England estate as opposed to like a castle or a huge modern-ish campus. Uh, also, having the locals close at hand can offer a lot of opportunities to role play. You know, the clueless, mundane person like to walk in at just the wrong time, be like, "What are you doing?" and have have the kids deal with that. Yeah, that's one of the great things about Eagles Claw is that it's set in the middle of a city. So not only do you have the campus to explore, um, but you also have places like the local harbor or the graveyard or just a bunch of other things. And being set in New Bedford, which is one of uh, at least Southern Massachusetts most historical looking and and really interesting historically uh, place is, I think just it, it's a lot of fun to to kind of try to fit local history into that or to say that, oh, we can go to, you know, one of the one of the many museums or many historical houses and have a fun adventure where you're chasing ghosts or you're trying to figure out who sabotaged the whaling museum. Um, mm -hmm. That kind of stuff, I think, is really fun as part of the story and just as part of the setting that we've created. I, I'm imagining like a cat and mouse game with with um, Eagle's Claw students, uh, as opposed to these um kooky conspiracy theorists that live among the mundane people that are constantly trying to expose uh, the magic people among us. And uh, yeah, having to deal with that all the time and dodge these folks. I live in New Bedford. So like, there's actually like a witch store and everything. So I would, it would be, I could just imagine that the students are going in that store specifically for supplies for class and dealing with the townies who are like, but why do I have to, why is it so much for that crystal? Like, what exactly is that crystal going to do for me? And like the magical folks know what it can do. The mundane and like the normies don't. I, I love that idea because I, I live here. So I get to see all the cool stuff that's, that is around here that the kids at e that Eagle's Claw students would interact with. I think yeah, it I is canonical that Phineas and Ferb do go to Eagle's Claw and they are. <laughs> oh, a hundred percent. That's why the summer why lasts so long. There's Absolutely. somebody out there with a cork board and all the red yarn and, and uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. pictures it's everywhere. Charlie Day. <laughs> there is someone. Her that's name is actually, Candace. Yeah. <laughs> uh, there's actually, so the idea that it's in like the middle of the city is also kind of um, different from a lot of the other magical schools that you see in, in fiction. Usually they're in like a very isolated place. It's like a castle on top of a hill. It's hidden somewhere like in plain sight, but very far from everything else and um the fact that it's kind of in the middle of a city and you have to deal with that kind of stuff i think is also great because i think a lot more people can empathize with that kind of thing a lot of people live in cities uh not many people have the uh ability nor the funds to go to a private boarding school in the middle of nowhere but everyone has been to you know a, a school or a church or even just a gathering of like-minded people uh in the middle of the city and i think that's great right yeah. Yeah. I love that about the, uh, it's, it's something I've always kind of loved is that we're, you know, when we were live and in person um, too, that was something that I think was really fun for the kids to imagine, you know, because mm -hmm. they felt like they were kind of this, like, you know, this like secret, you know, secret, but like in plain sight, um, which, which gives it kind of a fun. Um, I remember driving by the Trinity church where it would be and be like, Oh, that's cool. <laughs> Yes, all these little guys running around with, you know, with wands on. and stuff. I was like, oh, so that was good. awesome. Yes, definitely. So I have a fun question. If you were a student at Eagle's Claw, what kind of character would you want to be? And where would they spend most of their time? Hmm. Hmm. So thinker, uh, huh? <laughs> I would mm -hmm. be... I, I would, I mean, I would be human. I know that's the most vanilla choice you could possibly be, but I'd like to, I'd like to do like sorcery, like illusion based. Mm -hmm. And I'd spend all my time out on the town doing weird stuff with, uh, with visuals and sounds and seeing what I could get away with just, just because I can. I love it. <laughs> See, I, I am a musician. I'm a singer. I teach music and stuff. So I definitely think I would probably be in the bard realm. But I also like the idea of being like an echo knight because you could just bamf all over the place, which could be helpful and handy as a performer. Um, I have to go. I have to go with my favorite half work. I love. I love the half works. I even have tusks that I made for Ren Fair. So <laughs> some sort of half work bard fighter combo. Mm. 
Sounds I would, epic. Def I would definitely be my my new favorite race that isn't even official yet. It's just the, the Unearthed Arcana, which is a plasmoid, which is basically a like slime that has gained sentience and kind of turned generally human shape, but they can also just turn into a little slime puddle. Um, which I love so much. Uh, they can grow limbs. It's great. Um, I'd probably be a rogue because rogues are fun. I like the, I like, I like magic rogues, like arcane trickster rogues. Um, and I would definitely, I, I like the idea of like having my nose in a book, walking around, uh, school and seeing all of, like the adventure hero types, uh, going around and having their like crazy adventures and kind of just like scrolling, like figuring out that like someone like runs past me in the hall and is like, oh, wait a minute. I think like, th like people have been petrified recently and like they're 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 holding like a, a vial of green liquid i bet they're trying to like cure them or whatever and i'm like i'm not a part of any of these ventures i don't have to I, i'm not a part of the drama i just watch it all happen like my little own tv show like that would be that would be fun for me i love that gotta stop making oh, the fight boy. i like the drama <laughs> <laughs> i i think i would go with my standby of being a dwarf of some variety uh and uh you know uh, I was going to say arcane trickster, but I don't want to double up here. So I would probably actually go some variety of monk. Although uh, lately I've been feeling my uh, my theater roots. Uh, I actually spent all day yesterday doing an install, a uh, lighting install for an outdoor uh, venue for a, a production of the Go-Go's musical Head Over Heels. Uh, so maybe more, maybe more bard and do like... Uh, you know, flash and trash, uh, you know, effects bard with like all kinds of not offensive spells, but do all like the utility spells and do all kinds of creative uses for the utility spells where it's like dancing lights and press the digitation and booming voice and all these other uh, the big showy things, you know, that could be. Yeah, you can't really get more opposite than that. You you do the aesthetic monk or you do the uh, the splash and trash bard. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Like I can't. I've not it's heard the term awesome. flash and trash before. This is yeah. new for me. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, flat flash and trash is what uh, is what uh, lighting designers call concert lighting. Is where you're just like, oh. boosh, sploosh, you know, just all over the place. Yeah. Boots and pants and boots and pants. Isn't, it, isn't include isn't the sound the, effects? Isn't yep. that the Murdoch uh, promise? <laughs> splash and trash. <laughs> Oh boy, oh boy! We don't need to be picking fights with our fellow houses right now. <laughs> besides, the, the, Mur the Murdoch dropped out, so we don't. I know. are not here to defend themselves. Let's not. <laughs> yeah, uh, but Greg, we can we can double up. We can just be our arcane tricksters going around. I, I'd totally be down for that. Cousin Absolutely. Mischief. Yep. Yep. So, Ali, do, do you want to answer this? Do you have an idea of what you? Would yeah. Say? Well, so I was. I've been thinking about it while everyone's talking. I think. I mean, my. I'm, I'm being a little basic here, but I do love elves, but I probably go with like a half elf. Um, I love that like kind of, you know, same thing with half orcs. They're kind of in between two different, very different kinds of people. And they're, I love that like kind of interplay with that. Um, and I think I would probably go with uh, some sort of um, artificer, I think. Uh, I'm not sure if it would be like a, you know, the alchemist side or like the artillerist side, but I love like the little gadgets and like building little tiny things to do stuff and enchanting items. Like that's one of my favorite things to do in, in just regular D and D. So the idea that you can kind of take all of that stuff and um, you know, like make little magic. I'd probably be running like a little black market shop with like enchanted things to help you like do well in your tests. Um, that's probably what I would be doing. Ooh. Ooh, getting into the black market. You're, you're, you're the one selling Adderall. I'm a snow peak. I'm ambitious. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love that. Um, uh, so um, we are, I did wanted to mention that I forgot to, to remind myself earlier, but um, we will have um, a QA and a um, next Tuesday, I think, but watch for the announcement for that. But I think we're also going to run sort of a general Q&A session about character creation. We get a little bit closer to the um, to the actual event. So, you know, uh, if, if what we're talking about is a little bit mystifying for you, don't worry, we're going to help. Uh, make sure that your kids get to uh, to build a character that they're going to be very, very excited about. So um, 
Yeah, as a yeah. great woman once said, people love answering questions. They do. They certainly do. Um, so, uh, so let's talk a little bit more specifically about your the adventures that you guys have planned for Eagle's Claw. So, um, maybe to make it orderly, let's talk first about who's running an adventure during the April sixteenth event. That's me. Okay, why don't we start with you guys? So, Arthur, you're closest in my Brady Bunch lineup here, so you can go <laughs> first. Talk about your uh, kind of just a cliff notes about your uh, your adventure. Um, and uh, yeah, why should why should someone join your table? Arthur? Absolutely. Um, well, if you can't tell by my background, um, my adventure has a little bit to do with the library. Uh, the librarian uh, has some folks who have some overdue books, but uh, locator spells find them in the way way back sections of the library. Uh, so uh, they are going to task you in getting them back, but like. Like you would assume, the, this library is a little more chaotic and dangerous than your traditional library. Uh, maybe not mine, actually. My, my local library is extremely chaotic and dangerous, but you'll have to um, face a lot of interesting challenges and uh, maybe even uh, fight a few things to get to uh, these uh, your fellow lost students and make sure they return their books on time and possibly pay some fees if it's been that long. <laughs> love it all right mariah so uh my players will find themselves in a saturday morning detention Ooh. with a uh, burly impatient grumpy minotaur and uh they're supposed they're supposed to just do their time keep their heads down lest they get the horns and um <laughs> Basically, uh, exactly, Be definitely at the breakfast club. And um, there'll be moments where they'll be left alone and weird things are gonna be happening in the classroom and they're going to have to deal with it without getting into further trouble from uh, their detention monitor. Um, and they'll discover some information that'll be uh, important for the overall game later, but they're gonna have to try to balance being sneaky while also taking care of some things that can be dangerous or, you know, inconvenient. So it's a little balance of having fun with their friends, solving stuff while also not trying to get into trouble. Awesome. Or further trouble. I love the breakfast club angle. <laughs> Go ahead, John. You're, you're also doing an Eagle's Claw day of, right? The, the event. That's right. The, the day single day yeah. event. Single day yeah, I'll I'll be taking students on a little trip through the uh, the crawl spaces of Eagle's Claw, like the behind the walls sort of spaces. There is an uh, infestation of book mice that have been stealing pages from people's books and notes. And we've got to go in and capture the little guys. Um, the only problem is that book mice tend to live the material they've read, whether it be War and Peace or somebody's takeout receipts. Uh, if they're extremely well read, we may be in for a super weird day. <laughs> That's very funny. Um, uh, all right. And I know uh, Sarah had technical issues, so she had to drop out. But I know, Greg, you're, you are going to be running one of the uh, half day camps. Uh, coming yes. up for yeah, so I actually read a little bit about your adventure, but I, I want to I want I can't wait for you to tell people what what you're thinking. Well, um, since we're doing a, a, a week long half day adventure camp, I was thinking it would be uh, the a, a class field trip before finals. And uh, a couple of the party of uh, students they're they're on the, the field trip and they discover a magical artifact that is kind of uh, resonant to them. It kind of calls to them and uh, they wind up going off and. Uh, uh, doing something with the artifact and wind up embroiled in a bunch of time traveling trouble uh, where each uh, each day of the uh, the camp, they wind up in a different time period and they find themselves having to write parts of history that have been wronged uh, in order to make it back to class before the professor or make it back uh, to the field trip before the professors notice that they're gone. I love it. Yeah. So fun. Yeah. And I know, Mariah, you're going to be starting a weekly table after that. Do you have a different story in mind for that? Or you just kind of see where, where things I'm go? Gonna, or? 
I'm going to see how things go. Cause I know um, with like, I'm doing my Mondays and like I can fit in probably on like either a Wednesday or Thursday or something like that. So uh, probably for the weekly thing, I might pull a little bit more from like the Strixhaven stuff. So we'll see. Right. Cool. 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 Um, so final question um, is why should a kid come to the Eagles Claw event? Um, and uh We'll give you a minute. Ali, did you want to talk about, I didn't even think about it. Did you want to talk about, I know you did on another stream, but did you want to talk about kind of the overarching story while they think about that question? Yeah, yeah? sure. Okay, go for it. Yeah. Start the Jeopardy music. Um, so, <laughs> Let's see uh, <laughs> so, um, the, so uh, our plan in terms of uh, the, the event is that we're going to do uh, multiples of these throughout the year. Um, so the, when I was developing the story for, uh, this event and then the rest of the events, um, I wanted to make sure that they all kind of had a theme that went together. So the theme is, um, the, the wards that the founders put on Eagle's Claw to make sure that those non-magic individuals that, uh, wander through the city or maybe come across, um, the, the old church where Eagle's Claw is, um, <laughs> there is music, uh, where Eagle's Claw is <laughs> held, um, they, uh, the, those wards are fading and, you know, normal people are wandering in and wondering why all of these kids are holding wooden sticks and things are flying off the shelves or, you know, like, what is that? Is, is that a minotaur? What, what is happening here? Um, so to avoid that, to have to use a, a bunch of like memory spells to make sure that they can stay safe. Um, the headmaster of Eagle's Claw is asking for uh, the, the students help to try to track down where these wards are. Um, the first ward that they're tackling is the ward of Gretchen Grizzleheart, the founder of Grizzleheart. Um, yeah. She, yeah, exactly. We have a lot of Grizzlehearts here. Um, <laughs> we do. So uh, Gretchen Grizzleheart was a um, uh, the the one who basically founded the orphanage that the school grew into. Um, she's very important to a lot of like the everyday culture of Eagle's Claw, um, and she is a specialist in things like plant and earth magic. So. Um, there's going to be a lot of stuff like that, and uh, hopefully the students will learn a lot about Gretchen and uh, a lot of her work and help everyone uh, find the the magic uh, wards before everything kind of collapses and everyone in town suddenly figures out that they've got a school for magic in the middle of a big city. Love it. Um, sorry, I'm there. Yay. <laughs> All right. So um, your final question, lightning round. Why should a kid come to Eagle's Claw? Um, so I'm just going to go around. It looks like Arthur's ready. Go. Yeah, oh, I'm ready. Um, I won't try to convince you to come to my game because if, if I seem like fun and you want to come to my game, you'll have a lot of fun. But honestly, you're going to have fun no matter which of the GMs you choose to come with. But I think if you've been hesitant about trying a D, &D game um, if, it, if it's felt like a lot especially like as a kid um there can be a lot of complex rules um this whole like system we have changed it around to make it easier and more accessible for kids to come in we've got a expansive world that is going to be new to a lot of people so you don't have to be worried if you don't know things um but it, it also is going to be formed around what you're interested in what you want to do um and uh like you are going to be a part of a world with a bunch of other people just because you're in my game doesn't mean that like john's game isn't happening like next door and you can talk to your friends or other people that you meet and make friends and be like wow while i was searching the library you were like killing these spiders that actually could have attacked me um and like all of these things are happening together and you're going to be a part of this larger world that will not only affect like someone else's game but your game in the future like months down the line awesome all right mariah this is going to be a an event where even if you're not sure of how the rules work there's going to be people there to support you and to help you through and to like even 
figure out ways to get you into the game pretty quickly. Um, each of the games sounds super fun. I'm super excited to see who would like to play mine. I would be interested in playing any of those games. But it's also going to be a great spot where you can make friends, even start maybe even doing your own games together if you if you uh, like the system and everything. And it's it's been a while since these types of events have been able to happen. So it's really nice to be able to kind of get back into it in a very safe way. So I think this will be a great opportunity for uh, kids to not only potentially learn a new type of game, a new type of socializing, uh, but a way to make some more friends and stuff. Awesome. All right, John. Hey, you. It's a magic school with its own extra dimensional spaces for everything. You'll be in a class with all sorts of uh, crazy creatures. What is not to love about this? And and like everybody mentioned, this is a great a great way to get into Dungeons and Dragons. You're going to have somebody there that knows what they're doing to guide you through things. Uh, you won't have to go through the sometimes excruciating process of uh, of really like going into depth about how you're creating a character and stuff. It's a a short adventure to get you into things and it, you also get to buy into this um expansive universe that you all share with your friends when you go through it with each other and it's something that's going to continue on where we're we're doing events like these it's it's not it's it's going to be something you can come back to and be like yeah i affected the world uh when when uh, i was there at eagle's claw and it's going to persist like these things these things are are canon what i'm doing awesome all right greg Oh, you're muted, I think. Aha, gaming. Uh -huh. Gotta love them. <laughs> uh, I would say the number one reason to come and play uh, at Eagle's Claw is that uh, the Grizzle Hearts have a uh, bear named Mr. Reginald Fuzzy Bottom, and it is the greatest thing ever to hang out with Mr. Reginald Fuzzy Bottom. He's going Fuzzybottom. to feature heavily in my adventure. So if you want to come and play with Mr. Reginald Fuzzy Bottom, come and play Eagle's Claw. I kind of like the idea that Reginald Fuzzy Bottom has like, uh, like persisted over the years. Like that, there's always yeah. been a new one, right? I kind of love that idea. Um, yeah. How's mascot? <laughs> He's the mascot. Ali, why should kids come to Eagles Claw? Uh, well, I mean, everyone else basically said everything. It's a it's a wonderful, inclusive place where everyone can enjoy themselves. Um, but the other cool thing, uh, kind of on the meta side, is that what you do here in Eagle's Claw will affect Eagle's Claw in the future. So if your student finds a mystical herb in the kitchen garden, maybe they're going to, you know, name that herb after them, or maybe, you know, uh, chasing the book mice reveals a whole new area of the school that no one remembers. Um, so it's a persistent fun world where you can have real uh, tangible, like, uh, hands i guess into the story and help to shape it for the future of every other student that goes there which um i think is a great reason to come in and play right you belong here um ali while i have you and this is why i put you last is can you tell people a little bit about the adventure that is starting next thursday with your table of teams? yes because it's going to be a prequel <laughs> leading up into the the big event yes so um uh, I have a lovely group of teens who most of them have gone to Eagle's Claw when we were doing it in person. Um, and they are all extremely excited to return to the adventure and the school. Um, they've been uh, creating their characters and uh, deciding which house they, their, their character is going to belong in. And uh, they, they're just, they're so excited and I love to see it. Um, we've got wonderful art being drawn. Uh, one of them is composing music for uh for the adventure and for the eagles club the big event on the saturday um so it's going to be very fun and very uh very interesting um they as kind of the uh the the first ones to notice that these wards are fate are failing have to basically uh their their quest is basically to go around and find people who have wandered into eagles claw and figure out what to do with them so uh -huh. it's going to be cool. a two session adventure um and hopefully everyone tunes in and gets super excited because I'm super excited. <laughs> oh, that's going to be really fun. I was, so the Ali's group, if you guys don't know what they did, a disaster hamsters uh, stream uh, a few weeks back and it was, it yes. was quite entertaining. 
um, to uh, to watch and to listen to. I mean, I mean, talk about an example of like anything goes, you know, like they're yes. just <laughs> incredible imaginations just kind of went mm -hmm. wild with that. Well, thanks everybody for joining me um, today and for giving everybody a little bit of a peek into what Eagle's Claw is going to be as far as the Dungeons and Dragons adventure. I can't wait to see it. One of the things that I um, that I have in my head, and I think I've talked to you about it, Allie, is that I would love it if, because um, we're gonna, are we doing these on Discord? Is that the the video um, option that we're gonna use for these adventures? It's gonna be through Discord. Mm -hmm. So there's a way, is there a way for parents to spectate? to kind of watch the streams? Uh, yeah, like we can make a parent a parental role that doesn't have like voice privileges, but they could stop yeah. in and watch what's happening. Yeah, so Absolutely. that's I thought that that might be really kind of a fun thing for parents to be able to kind of peek in and and listen to their kids exploring their uh, their story um, if they wanted to listen in. Um, so that's something that I'm I'm strongly considering. I think that that would be fun. Tell us if that's something that you'd like. Um, you know, let me know if that's something that you'd be interested in is listening to your kiddos play um, for the event. So um, thanks so much for joining us. Um, and uh, please let us know if you guys have any questions. Um, and uh, we're really looking forward to this event. I know that it's going to be amazing with these amazing humans. I mean, I mean, what could be better than than having an awesome D and D game with these people? So, all right, guys, thanks so much, and uh, we will catch you guys next week with um, Allie's intro to Eagles Claw game. Cheers! Bye. Bye. <laughs>